To those here with us, those viewing this live, and those watching sometime later, good evening and welcome to the 20th Annual Story Prize event. We're here to honor three outstanding and distinctive short story collections, Wednesday's Child by Yi Yun Lee, Other Minds and Other Stories by Bennett Sims, and The Hive and the Honey by Paul Yoon. The three finalists will each read from their books, then talk about their work with me. At the end of the evening, Jay Lindsay, the president of the Chisholm Foundation, which has generously backed the Story Prize and made this award possible, will announce the winner. Before we get to that, however, in honor of celebrating 20 years of the Story Prize, we're going to share a short video with photo and video highlights from past events. As you'll see, we've been fortunate to have some amazing finalists and winners over the years. We established this prize more than 20 years ago to fill a void in the array of existing book awards. Short story collections were rarely chosen as finalists, let alone winners. Consequently, the spotlight didn't often shine on an essential literary form. The short story. We're pleased to let story collections have their night. It began with with Jay and Julie Lindsay, who had the vision and generosity to create a book award for short story collections. We spent months planning the story prize, looking at how other awards worked, and considering what we could do to ensure a fair process and a good result. We decided we would choose the three finalists, then turn it over to three outside judges to decide the winner. The judges would not all be fiction writers. Instead, we would include a bookseller or a librarian, critics, book bloggers, academics, literary magazine editors, and others, alongside writer judges each year. Recently, other book awards have adopted a similar approach. We also decided to offer a substantial top prize of $20,000, at the time the most of any annual US book award for literary fiction. In 2003, I went on a listening tour, talking to writers, agents, and top editors at publishing houses to hear their thoughts on book awards, and we factored their feedback into our planning. I'm sorry for the long history. <laughs> our first event on January 26, 2005, was at Symphony Space in the selected shorts format in which actors read the stories. It was a great evening, however, we found this approach didn't bring enough attention to the writers we were honoring. We then moved on to the new school for the next 16 events and came up with the format we still follow, part reading, part discussion. In 2021, the pandemic forced us to record our event via Zoom, the one time we haven't been able to do it live. We're now in our third year at the Lotus Club, a more intimate space where we can provide a full room. But enough, enough background, uh, let's let the highlights do the talking. The Story Prize was conceived and launched in 2004 to recognize the short story form and honor its most accomplished writers. Since then, this book award has been given annually to the best short story collection of each calendar year, as determined by a panel of distinguished judges. Among the winners of the Story Prize are some of the most accomplished short story writers of our time. How much I love this form, how much I love meeting people who create such wonderful work. I'm so thrilled to be here, and what a special night this is. All these people dressed beautifully here to Talk about short stories, the best literary form. The Story Prize has also recognized as winners several exciting up-and-coming writers. And many other renowned short story writers have been honored as finalists for the award. I learned how to be a fiction writer by writing short stories, and I still find this form to be like extremely daunting and difficult. In shorter fiction, the freedom you can have 
The length is everything. You can do things you couldn't do otherwise. You wouldn't tolerate for 300 pages. A novel is a political act. The characters want one thing, the plot wants another, the setting, the situation. You must compromise. And, but in a story, you can be a pure dictator. You can make every facet contribute to a total effect. A short story has its own voice, but it also has limits, space and time limits, and you don't want to waste time with just sort of wandering off here and there. The Story Prize will continue to celebrate outstanding short story collections and to honor accomplished fiction writers in the years ahead. Thank you to the Story Prize magicians. Anything that brings stories to a larger audience is so vital and important. We all know that we don't have anything except those small motions of the mind and the heart that incline us towards one another, uh, soften our borders. So one of the reasons I love uh, being a reader and a writer, uh, especially a short story writer, is that the form reminds us that those things aren't minor, they're everything. And that in fact, our job here is to make those connections outward. And literature can serve as kind of a modeling of that kind of thing. So I'm so honored to get this award and to be part of that tradition. Thank you so much. Good night. <laughs>
what she had wanted was to talk with someone about the novels. And so she had, and so she had asked Marcy to read them. I can't believe you asked me to read these books, Marcy said when she had finished. Are they confusing, Rosalie said. I was confused too. Confusing, no, but they're rather, what do you call it, graphic. They're not pornography. <laughs> they're worse than pornography. Marcy, who by middle school had become a better cook and baker than Rosalie, was carving out balls of cantaloupe with an ice cream scoop. I think they may have permanently destroyed my appetite. There was plenty of violence in the trilogy, rapes, mutilations, executions. Before Marcy's remark, it had not occurred to Rosalie that the books might, be age, might not be age appropriate. In eighth grade, Marcy had quoted C.S. Lewis in her application to a highly selective prep school. I fancy that most of those who think at all have done a great deal of their thinking in the first 14 years, and then gone on to catalog all the thinking she had done. Might now this come across as a bit arrogant? Rosalie had asked, and Marcy had replied that if any of the adults dared to judge her so, it was they who were arrogant. They, Marcy had said, instead of you. Thus, to Rosalie's relief, excluding her from the indictment. If those adults judged her, it meant, that she, it meant that they had not done their share of thinking when they were young. Older now, they felt they had a right to treat children like miniature poodles. Miniature poodles, I'm telling you, Marcy had said with a vehement shudder not even standard poodles. <laughs> That's the poodle here and not put that standard miniature poodle. And just half a page from the last uh, story of the, just last half page of the book. I could not, I could not make a romance out of Lily's story. It's about a, hairdresser Lily telling the story. She was not the first person I had let down with my writing. During those years, while my children were in preschool, at the beginning of each semester, we were asked to send a care package that was to be kept at the school in case of a catastrophic earthquake. In the care packages, we were to include a few non-perishable snacks, a family photo, a small stuffed animal, and a note to the children telling them that if their parents could not make it to the school, there was nothing for them to worry about. Everything would be fine, the note was to say. Everything would be all right in the end. I had always prepared the snacks and the stuffed animal and the family photo, but I have never been able to write a note to my children. What could I say to them? If your teacher is reading this to you, it means that mommy and daddy are late picking you up. It may also mean that we'll never come back for you, but all will be well in the end. We lived through their childhoods without being hit by a deadly earthquake. The care packages were returned to us when the children graduated from preschool. Still, if a writer cannot write a simple note as a parental duty, what meaning is there in the words she does write? A few days ago, I got an email from my former student who had vowed to dismantle my cannon. She said that she was traveling in South America. She mentioned a few things she had learned from our clashes. 
I remember that once you said, one must want, one must want to be great in order to be good. To this day, I still wonder why you looked sad when you said that, she wrote. Under what circumstances had I said that? And said about what? Had she written to enlighten me about what real life was, I would have applauded her consistency. Instead, in her long email, she talked about what I had taught her. I too had been young then. How could I have taught anyone anything? All will be well. All will be well. And every kind of thing shall be well. Yet, I could not even write a lying note to console my children. Thank you. Beautiful. So was that that was the first and last story? The first and the last collection? story, yeah. How do you how do you put a collection together? How do you decide what order to put the stories in? Well, I, I you know, I, I think <laughs> the first the, the, this collection is a little weird. The first story and the last story both feature a female writer and parent. And I just thought opening was a story mother and you know mother child and closing with this probably the same woman but they're different characters so so I, I think there's that very nice opening and closing for the collection <laughs> and most of the stories are about caretakers mm -hmm. so you know mothers and nannies and caretakers so so I think that's a good way to put the stories together one thing that was very different in this collection than from the last collection that was a story prize finalist a while ago yes. is that these stories are mostly set in the US mm -hmm. and um, you know is that just part of your progression in, in life or something that you just you know wanted to focus on right well you know the, this collection had stories written in 14 years yeah. and you know I, I had started with 30 stories and we, ch we cut down to these stories. So it wasn't conscientious you know, decision not to write about China. Mostly I feel like the writer's life bleeds into the work. And I've lived in America for so many years and my life bleeds into the work. And so in the end, I think when I look, I have other stories who did not make into the collection. Some of them were very odd stories. They just mm -hmm. didn't fit. For instance, I have one story where Richard II from Shakespeare, Richard II and, and Nick Bottom from The Midsummer's Night, and they had an encounter, and they had a very good conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it, was the, it was a very fun story to write, except it couldn't, I couldn't find a place for this in this collection or in any collection. It was just a very odd encounter, and they had a little bit gay romance in the end. So <laughs> what I meant is I have written more stories, but in, you know, in putting the collection together, I think some of these stories or most of these stories speak to a certain you know, theme or, or pattern of behavior, I think. Yeah, there's a, a real unity. You know, there's real commonality among the stories. How do you know when you're ready to put out a, a new collection? Do you need 30 stories so you can <laughs> eliminate half? It was quite funny because my, 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 my editor Mitsu is here and we talked about it. We started with so many stories and I cut half and I give her maybe 15 or 16 stories. And I knew three of them would not quite just be strong enough as the other 13 stories. And Mitzi said, can we take them out? I said, if you take them out, they're orphans. They will never <laughs> get into any collection. <laughs> and Mitzi said, I think it's going to be OK. <laughs> and I really actually think it's going to be OK. And I actually, I was glad I did not include those three stories. Yeah, I, I think partly, as I said, you know, I've written 
these stories in 14 years, sometimes there are some repetitions. So one story we took out, it doesn't mean it's a bad story, it just there's a rep rep repetition, so we took out that repetition. Are you always working on stories, or do you sometimes put that aside to write you know, a novel or a nonfiction book? Right. No, I wish I could put them aside, because I just said I'm going to work on a long project, and uh, I started a story yeah. a couple of weeks ago. I, I think I always like to have a short story by the side because I write stories very slowly. I would probably take a year to write a story. So, so here and there I would put a few pages in. But oftentimes I would not know where the stories are going. So, I, so months of you know, percolation and, and thinking and then going back to, to write, yeah. So what's your process like for a story? It just an idea comes to you and... Right, so what's, I, I can give an example, a couple okay. of examples. You know, years ago I was teaching in, I was teaching California and a student of mine wrote a story about imaginary friends for children. I was a young, I have to say, I was a young writer then. I was a young teacher, so I was very harsh. I said, imaginary friends, very boring. <laughs> <laughs> and then I explained to her why the story was so boring. I said, all oh, children have imaginary friends. There's nothing new about that. And if you cannot find something new, there's nothing. I, I don't want to read the story. It's very boring. <laughs> And then one day, I, I, some of you know that Edmund White and I, since the pandemic started, we Skype every day. And one day, Edmund White, so now there's this writer in his 80s starting to talk about his imaginary friends. <laughs> his childhood imaginary friends. There was not one, there were three imaginary friends. They, are named, they were named Tom Thumb Thumb, Cottage Cheese, and Georgie Porgy. <laughs> and then he started to describe the, <laughs> the three friends. Georgie Porgy was this wild boy living in the woods, sometimes coming to visit Edmund and Cottage Cheese and Tom Thumb Thumb. And Cottage Cheese was a bossy little girl, and Tom Thumb Thumb was not very good, just like a follower. Well, now here you have an 80 year old, 82 year old man talking about his imaginary friends as a child. I found that so fascinating. And then he turned to me, he said, do you have, did you have imaginary friends? I said, are you kidding me? I, I grew up in Beijing. I live in a, a bedroom where I shared my bedroom with my grandfather and my sister. I said, there was no space for imaginary friends. <laughs> <laughs> because Edmund's imaginary friends, they had their own places at their table, <laughs> they had their own bed. And he said, oh, I was, I, was, I was sitting in daddy's big car riding to the dentist and cottage cheese was next to me looking into my <laughs> So in any case, this was a long conversation. And then next day I started to write a story about an 80 year old woman and her caretaker talking about imaginary friends, childhood imaginary friends. I did go to Edmund, I said, can I use your friends' names? He said, yeah, so Georgie Porgy and, and Tom Sam Sam and <laughs> Cottage Cheese were in the story and I actually named the character Edwina. <laughs> I, I, I told Edwin, I said, you know, you're, you're, you're doing a drag show in my story. <laughs> so, so that's the beginning. So I, I think it's always something that you hear in life or you, 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 you read in newspapers. Something just grab your attention. So after I wrote that, I thought, well, that's a very good imaginary friends story because only the imaginary friends are more interesting for older people than for children. So I don't find my story boring. <laughs> <laughs> and, and your student, has your student read this? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It was from years ago. <laughs> well, you might hear from that person. Oh, yeah. I hope so. Yeah. That's an interesting story because it's, it's long and it's in three different parts. Have, have you ever written a story like that before? I, you know, for, for, for the last finalist, uh, 
book, I had one novella, mm -hmm. like right. hundred page novella. And this one is actually novella lands three part stories. But I did write each story as an individual story, and I published them as individual story. But they are they actually they were published in the same magazine, Jolly Trope. <laughs> it's a serialized the three seasons. But each of the stories, three parts, each could read as an independent story. It's the first time I did it, and I found very satisfying. The experience was very good because. And in, in the first story, they talk about you know imaginary friends. In the second story, all of a sudden, there's not only imaginary friends. There's a ghost train. Ghost train also came from Edmund's reminiscing about his childhood. He said, "Well, I used to babysit this little child, and he wouldn't sleep. So I made up a story about a ghost train. If the ghost train came and said, 'True, true, you have to sleep.'" <laughs> 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 I thought it was fabulous. So I, I also borrowed that. So the, and then you know, well, you you work with these characters, and then their stories just came in more and more. So. So your process is basically you talk to Edmund White, <laughs> yes, yes, <I laughs> and, then, and then you write stories. I, I write stories. I just I just started a new story. I actually told Edmund. I said I started a new story. I actually named one character Edmund, but Edmund in my story is not a gay writer, it's a straight man, but he's a writer and he writes faster than you do. <laughs> <laughs> so. so is that a more recent story because, you know, post-pandemic? Uh, the, the, that story. Yeah. Well, most of, yeah, I think, I think that story, long story, the three-part story probably was one of the last stories I wrote for the collection, yeah. When you, do you write all the way through and then revise, or do you revise as you go along, or some combination? I think because I write so slowly, I probably have done a fair amount of thinking when I was, when I've been working on it. I don't do a lot, okay, I shouldn't say that because Cressida is here. <laughs> my, new, <laughs> my New Yorker editor, Cressida is here. I mean, she worked on both of the stories. I, I almost said I don't revise, and which is not true. We do a lot of revision. <laughs> and can I share the story, Cressida, about revision? Sometimes revision is actually not revision, it's rewriting. Mm -hmm. So years ago, I wrote a story, Cressida said, uh, the story was set in an English B and B. Cressida said, "Interesting characters, very boring story." <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, I just love when she said, "It's really boring." The English B and B. It's just English B and B. It's very boring. I said, "How how do I revise this?" Cressida said, "I think you need to get rid of the English B and B." The entire story happened in Eng English B and B. <laughs> <laughs> And so I did get rid of the English B and B. The story was much better, I would say. So I so that's revision too. Mm -hmm. That's just re revision, right? You, you you have a new vision for the story. That's right. that's entire a revision. Yeah. At what point do you show a story to someone else, like to Cressida or other writers you know? Uh, to Bridget, who's I mean I'm I'm, in, I'm insisting talking about my people here <laughs> because I. I have three very good editors in there. So I show Bridget very early on. And, and I mean, sometimes she would say things like not so good or something. <laughs> no, never, right? Uh, yeah. I have a Bridget story. I, I, I once worked with her on a manuscript and we, and there was one line that I was actually very proud. It was extremely poetic. And I looked across, I noticed she wrote BS <laughs> <laughs> next to the line. So I knew that was, wasn't good. So, so I, I just, I feel like when you work with, you know, Bridget Cressida and Mitzi, when you work with them for so long, you know when they say something you need to listen to, right? Someone says BS, you better do a better job. <laughs> Before you had these, Fantastic editors. How did you teach yourself to, to write a story? What was what was that like for you? Right. You know, I remember last time when I did a reading, I started reading not my story, but William Trevor's story. Right. I, I read one page from a William Trevor story. I, I before I had before I started working with these wonderful 
editors. I think I learned writing stories by reading William Trevor. And over the years, I've, you know, I've still been read, I've been reading him for the past 20 years. In my earlier career, I like to, if I was writing a story, I would like to imagine I was writing a story in conversation with a William Trevor story. So especially in my earlier you know, work, there was always a Trevor story I had in mind when I was writing it. So, so that was you know, setting the bar there and trying to reach, trying to write yeah. like William Trevor. So do you do some reading every day of favorite stories and favorite writers, or to turn to it when you feel like you need inspiration? How, how do you work that into your? I think, uh, right, I, I, th I think over the pandemic, I've been reading a lot of short stories. But when I write stories, or if I'm actively writing a short story, I think most possibly I would read a Trevor story or a few Trevor stories. But I have also been reading Mavis Galan who was very good at helping you write stories. <laughs> and Edmund and I did all the Edith Bowen stories. You know, I think there are just a lot of different kind of writers. I, I think uh, Grace Paley, at one point, I was, I did have maybe three Grace Paley stories that didn't get into the collection. Again, they sounded like Grace Paley <laughs> rather than me. So it didn't get into the collection. But so I, I, I do read a lot of short stories. And I read Elisa McCracken, who's there, <laughs> <laughs> only because, you know, some people, you read them, just you enjoy their crafts or you enjoy their language. Elisa's stories always make me want to write. And every time I read Elisa's stories, I feel I'm ready to write another story. So that's, that's you know, when I'm eager to write stories, I have my pile of story collections to read. Is there anyone else in the room you want to mention? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I think I have mentioned a lot of people, Paul and Bennett. <laughs> it just happened I read both of their uh, collections in the manuscript stage, and I blurbed both books. <laughs> so I do want to mention these two writers. I admire them very much. <laughs> So, <laughs> so no matter who wins, you win. Well, I, thank you very much, yes. yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. Our second finalist is Bennett Sims. In the collection Other Stories and Other Minds, Sims plays with form and genre. Some pieces resemble essays as much as stories, though they don't feel entirely autobiographical either. He writes with an almost mathematical precision and invites the reader to engage on a deeper level. Bennett? Thank you, Larry, <clears throat> for that lovely introduction. Thank you all for coming. Um, and thank you, Ian, for that lovely reading and conversation. Um, can everyone hear me OK? Great. Um, so I'm just going to read the title story for my collection, Other Minds, um, which is about 7 minutes and 30 seconds. <laughs> Speaking of mathematical precision, yeah. Um, Other Minds. The reader was reading an e-book in a cafe. Whenever he arrived at a sentence that other readers had highlighted, a pop-up notification would display how many times it had been underlined. The reader had come to dread this feature. No matter what genre of novel he was reading, the same type of sentence was always underlined, maxims about love. If a sentence began, love was, or being in love meant, it was sure to have a dotted line running underneath with the notification, 650 other readers <laughs> have highlighted this passage. Meanwhile, the rest of the novel would remain unmarked. 
Pages of precise description, dinner party set pieces, digressions, the kind of language that he would have underlined with his own pen if he were reading a physical copy would go ignored as though they had made no impression on these other readers at all. Today's novel was no exception. He clicked ahead, skimming the highlighted passages. The secret of love, that was what being in love was. <laughs> Apparently, the only language that other readers loved, the reader was coming to realize, was language about love. He could not understand this. He could not imagine what was going on inside these other readers' minds while they read. Whenever he came across a precise description of someone's thoughts, of a field, of a dinner party, a little pleasure would light up in his brain. Yet when these other readers came across that same language, he supposed, their brains must remain blank, their minds as inert and slate gray as the e-reader's screen. The boredom he felt when reading about maxims about love must be what they felt when reading about thoughts. The pleasure he felt when encountering a sentence with a thought tag in it, he thought, I imagined, it dawned on her, must be what they felt when encountering popular propositions about love. Love was, being in love is. It was hard to fathom, but the evidence of the highlights was undeniable. In the beginning, when he had first bought the e-reader, he had felt superior to these other readers, more sophisticated. They must lack the taste, he told himself, or the judgment to appreciate the sentences that he did. Or else, he found himself thinking, they must have highlighted their own sentences mindlessly at the prompting of the pop-up for no other reason than that the passage had already been highlighted by so many previous readers. As though each reader were like a walker following the same shortcut through a field, he imagined, flattening it further and contributing to the desire line that would go on calling to future walkers. He no longer felt this way about the highlights. By now, he had read enough e-books and encountered enough underlinings that he had begun to suspect that his mind was the one that was missing something. Tens of thousands of readers had been moved by these maxims about love so moved that they had placed their fingertips or their styluses to the touch screens of their devices and had physically caressed the sentences. And these same tens of thousands of readers had meanwhile passed over precise descriptions of thoughts and landscapes with perfect indifference, numb to their pleasures. What the e-reader had revealed to the reader was just how far he was outnumbered by this numbness. To these other readers, he knew his mind would be the curiosity. Why did he care more about landscapes than love? What was wrong with him? All his life, if someone had asked him why he read, the reader would have answered that he was curious about other minds. He read to learn how other minds saw, thought, experienced the world. He believed that his own mind could be reflected and enlarged by the language of other minds. Even if he found a book boring, it was enough to remind himself that another mind had produced this boredom, that another brain perceived the world in this boring way to revive his interest and inspire him to finish. But ever since discovering the highlight feature, he was not so sure he wanted to learn any more about other minds. <laughs> Increasingly, the thought of other minds disquieted him. When 600 readers highlighted a sentence about love or ignored a precise description, that certainly gave him an insight into their minds. But it was not an insight that he desired. If anything, he felt isolated inside it, locked in a loneliness indistinguishable from solipsism. The idea that he was the only reader in the world underlining precise descriptions frightened him. It would be like attending a dinner party, he imagined, where you were the only guest to order dessert and where you noticed all your friends wincing one by one as you brought a spoonful of ice cream to your mouth and where gradually it dawned on you that for these people, perhaps people you had known for years, whose inner lives and sensory experience you had always taken it for granted resembled your own, for them ice cream must taste like ash and where finally, to seal your dread, you would watch on in horror as each of them delicately dipped their spoons into the table's cigarette trays and fed on actual ash, <laughs> sucking from their spoons like hummingbirds at a feeder to savor the flavor. You might not want to stay at such a dinner party very long. You might not want to learn how else their minds diverge from yours. Indeed, you might even begin to suspect not just that they possessed other minds, different minds, but that they did not possess minds or what you would recognize as a mind at all. Robot minds, yes, possibly pod person minds, 
but not human minds. The reader set his e-reader down and looked up at the cafe, studying the faces of the other people around him. Many were silently reading their own books, magazines, tablets, phones. Even now, he thought, were they underlining maxims about love? Some of them could be the very same readers who had left highlights in this novel. Some of them could be highlighting the novel right now. Their minds were a mystery to him, and more and more, the mystery was beginning to seem menacing and mutual. He packed his e-reader and gathered his things. He would stop by the bookstore on the way home, he decided, and buy a physical copy of the novel. As he crossed the cafe, some of the other readers glanced up from their devices and smiled at him, and he wondered for the first time what being read by them might be like. How would these other readers read him? If he were to precisely describe his own thoughts, he thought, if he were to write about his experience as a reader and how it felt to encounter other minds, and if he were to post it on the ebook store for others to read, would any of these readers recognize themselves in his descriptions? Would they find something in them, in him, worth highlighting? Or would they skim his thoughts with impatience, waiting for what his mind had to tell them about love? He left the cafe and headed in the direction of the bookstore. His mind would be boring to them, he knew. They might force themselves to read on, even to finish, but there would be nothing there to underline. He did not think his thoughts had much to do with love. Unless it dawned on him as he arrived at the bookstore, this was also what love was. He stood outside the entrance, thinking. Unless the secret of love just was this boredom, he thought. A little pleasure lit up in his brain. Excited, he continued past the store and hurried home. Back at his apartment, he went straight to his computer and began to type. He would write it down, he decided, and he would see. He would post it on the ebook store and see. Because what if that was what being in love was after all? Learning to look into another's mind, even when it was mind numbing. Even if you would not highlight a single line, it was love. Thank you. So the obvious question is, have you seen this in ebook form, and have you seen how people have marked it? That is an obvious question. Um, and, <laughs> and I say that in a way that recoils on me, because until this moment, it had never occurred to me that I could uh, look at the e-reader version of this book and see what people have been highlighting. Um, so no, I have not. Um, but hopefully, any line with love in it is, is well represented. Right. <laughs> Uh, this story and several others in the collection you write as one unbroken paragraph <coughs> the entire story. Um, how did you come about that approach and, and what, what works for you to, to do it that way? Yeah, so the story I just read, which y'all could not see but maybe could feel, is a block paragraph. So there are no section breaks or page breaks or even indentations. It's just a wall of text. Um, and that is a form that I adopted from this Austrian novelist, uh, Thomas Bernhard, who writes entire novels as block paragraphs, so a 200-page block of text. He uses that form as a way of expressing the claustrophobic self-consciousness of his narrators. Um, so they're often seated in one space, stuck in a static setting, but diverging quite widely in time and memory, um, and he uses um, the stuckness within their minds to represent their own stuckness in space and unstuckness in time as they pursue their own rants and digressions. Um, his internal monologists are often really misanthropic and ranting. He's famous for being um, a vitriolic, uh, funny, misanthropic writer. Um, my favorite novel of his is Woodcutters, about a narrator who is stuck at a dinner, an artistic dinner party um, <laughs> with a... I just came from one of those. Yes. <laughs> the food was much better at ours. <laughs> um, yeah, so he's stuck at an artistic dinner party with people he loathes, and he spends 200 pages in a block paragraph thinking about how much he loves them until he hits this weird emotional pivot uh, midway and then later through the novel where he realizes how deeply he loves them and how deeply entangled with them he is. And then he races home to write about it and presumably is writing the novel that we're reading. So if you can call that a plot, I borrowed that plot for this story, <laughs> um, uh, which also involves a character kind of traversing the trajectory from hatred to love and then racing home to, to write about it. 
And the other stories that take that form have similar trajectories, would you say? Is that why you, you choose to present them that way? Yeah, I'm really interested in how Bernhard accomplishes these psychological pivots, that all of the movement in the story is internal. It's coming from the volatility of his narrator's emotions and moods and realizations about themselves. Um, it's not coming from external action. So yeah, a narrator in a Bernhard story can spend the entire um, novel sitting in a wing chair at an artistic dinner party or sitting at a bench in front of a painting um, at uh, a museum in Vienna um, and just describing their thoughts for 200 pages. And all of this feeling of narrative momentum that you're getting um, are how their minds are changing course um, in that space. So three of the stories that are quite long block paragraphs, I guess including this one, there's one called Introduction to the Reading of Hegel, which is about a philosophy graduate student struggling to write a fellowship application. And that takes place in a library um, as he's stuck inside his own head for 30 unbroken pages. Um, and the other, uh, Portino uh, Portinaccio Sarcophagus, takes place um, at a Museum of Antiquities in Rome where the narrator is sitting before um, this um, sarcophagus and describing it in a block paragraph for 20 pages and sort of pursuing the memories that it, it uh, dredges up for him. Do you consider all of your stories fiction, or do you feel like that's not an important distinction for you? Because they don't all feel like fiction usually feels? That's a good question. Um, I sort of courted the autofictional collapse of the narrator with myself in that story, Portinaccio Sarcophagus, to the extent that anyone reading the paratextual materials around this collection will know that I spent a year in Rome at the American Academy, as the narrator of that story does. And the story reproduces photographs and images, both of the artwork the narrator's looking at and things that he remembers. And one of the images that the narrator uh, reproduces is a family photograph that I provided for the story, which appears to show my mother standing in front of a, a tombstone with the figure of the Grim Reaper behind her. It's like this ghostly photograph that has been circulating among my siblings and that I found a home for <laughs> in that story. Um, <laughs> One of the things I really respond to in Zabald, um, who also often reproduces pseudo-documentary images in his texts, is the ways in which he quibbles with these distinctions and sort of mischievously blurs them and also invites the reader to identify his narrators with himself. Um, so I think of that story as a short story, not an essay, and not a work of nonfiction. It includes uh, lies in it. <laughs> but. Uh, I, yeah, I sort of court the reader's assumption that the narrator shares his biography with mine and the place from which um, those assumptions are launched is that photograph that is a family photograph that I included. So you sort of, it allows you to depart from the actual, you know, autobiographical aspect and shape it more into some kind of fictional arc. Is, is that how you would describe it? Yeah, I think that <clears throat> one of the things Zabel does with it is that his narrators and his, his uh, books are really interested in coincidence and uncanny patterns of repetition across history and across memory. So his narrators get really excited when a character shares the same birthday with another character or shares the same name or something like that. And you sense this kind of like web of fate or destiny running through all of these digressive essayistic passages in the book. And one of the ways in which his works of fiction authenticate those coincidences is by pretending to be works of fact. Um, so including pseudo-documentary photographs that might be photographs of real people, but might be postcards he picked up in a flea market, or might be uh, real photographs of a journal, or might be a journal he wrote and attributed to a fictional character and took foxed photographs of. Um, that story, Portinaccio Sarcophagus, is also really interested in kind of uncanny, haunted coincidences and patterns that the narrator is just now becoming alert to. And so I, one of the things I wanted the photograph to do was to invite the reader to um, read those coincidences as factual and not invented. Um, and the critic, Ryan Ruby, has this great line about Zabold, which is that too much has been made of the photographs. Um, in the end, the, the, their sole function in the story <laughs> is to trick the reader into thinking that the coincidences in the text can be found in the world. Um, and they're just like a sleight of hand to turn our attention away from the books and into history. Have you, in, in your approach to writing with these types of stories, have you 
met with resistance as you were starting to write and trying to get them published, or have you feel like you've been able to win people over? Uh, that would be a question for my wonderful agent, Jen Aw. <laughs> um, I don't know the answer to it. Uh, <clears throat> I, I assume by like the, the length of time it takes for the stories to get placed, um, there must be some resistance, but. <laughs> I was thinking more like in a writing workshop or, you know, getting feedback from a teacher. Oh yeah, that's a that's a, a generous question. So like I, I went to the Iowa Writers Workshop a little over a decade ago, um, which has a reputation for being a program that's aesthetically interested in staid realism, or at least it did when I went, or like straightforward realism. Um, but I was there with people doing lots of interesting, bizarre things, including my friends Tony Tulatamudi and Evan James, who are here tonight, um, and Carmen Machado was in our first workshop. Um, and so I feel like from them especially, I've, I've met very little resistance when even as a student I was turning in block paragraph stories. Um, but inevitably it's a room full of 12 readers who have all read different things and are coming with different tastes and traditions that they're working in. And so I would get comments from people like, what would the story look like if you indented it somewhere? <laughs> yeah. So it, it, you know, it takes a certain amount of Conviction, I guess, to stick with that. Yeah, conviction or like like narcissistic identification with one's influences. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, well, Bernhard can do this, so why can't I do this? Yeah. So your book's published by a publisher most people might not have heard of called Two Dollar Radio, um, which is a small, a prestigious small press publisher. Do you feel like that gave you more freedom in how you put together your collection and even in, in the stories you wrote? Yeah, so they're also here tonight, my editor, Eric, um, and uh, publicist, Brett. And Eric has been a really generous and flexible editor, and I felt pretty free to experiment with form in all the books I've published with them. My, my first book with them was um, a zombie novel that was heavily footnoted. Um, my, my first collection with them also included stories with images, including reproductions of stills from Hitchcock films that I did chase down permissions for. Um, and yeah, they, and, and all the books they publish, they're really encouraging of, of playfulness with form um, and experimentation. Are you, in the writing you're doing now, are you continuing in this vein or are you finding yourself going in some different directions? I mean, it, within this book, there are different types of stories also. Yeah, I mean, I tend to think about any given project that I'm working on as being in conversation with a constellation of other artworks that I'm interested in, in being in dialogue with. Um, and so this book, I think, was where I was working most self-consciously with Bernhard and Zabald as influences for the stories we've been talking about in particular. But there are other authors I was thinking about in this book, like Shirley Jackson and Brian Evanson and Kazuo Shiguro um, and so on. And so the stuff I'm working on now has its own constellation. Um, and I think I want to challenge myself to move away from the block paragraph form <laughs> for it, um, and ex experiment with indentations and page breaks, yeah. It seems as though the other stories in the collection that aren't yeah. in block form are sort of exploring uh, genre, different kinds of genre, like um, the last story is something of a detective novel, um, although I wouldn't say that entirely captures it. And, mm. and the first, there, there's sort of like a, almost like a feeling of horror to the first story mm. in the collection. Is, is, is that something you like to do also, is to take a genre approach to story writing? Yeah, so as I said, my first novel was like a zombie novel, but it's a zombie novel without zombies. Like they're all safely quarantined and don't pose any threat to any of the characters. Um, <laughs> and so it's sort of like a horror novel with an asterisk in that the only horror the characters experience is psychological horror, like their own paranoia or anxiety about living through what I would not have then described as like a, a pandemic. Um, but uh, yeah, now post COVID, that's what it is. Um, so it's a lot of quarantine anxiety in that book. Um, I continue to be interested in psychological horror. A lot of the stories in my second collection are just about paranoid, over-anxious narrators um, locked in their own monologues. This book was the first one where I became really interested in 
pushing my characters into horrific situations that departed from reality and obeyed a kind of anxiety dream logic. And so I was thinking about Shirley Jackson or, or David Lynch um, or, or Brian Evanson, particularly, um, who is um, kind of a philosophical, hard short story writer and novelist with a really stripped down minimalist prose style um, that he has refined to express his own character's sense of dislocation and disorientation um, whenever they enter like an askew um, environment. Um, so yeah, that first story and that last story that you were just talking about, I was thinking a lot about Evanson and, and Shirley Jackson. The title story you read, Other Minds, that seems to be a focus of the book. And it almost seems as though no matter how hard you try, you can't really understand an, another mind. Is that fair? Is that where you think it, it lands, or do you think it's maybe more expansive <clears throat> than that? So there's a line in the story where it says, if you asked him why he read, he would have said, because he's curious about other minds, which is also a line that appears in another story, Introduction to the Reader, uh, Reading of Hegel. His point of view character is also simply called the reader. Um, and I, like, I would say that line sincerely and unironically. Like, that is why I read, because I'm curious about other minds. And I do believe it's possible to communicate or evoke one's experience, conscious experience of the world in language. And that's what's exciting about literature as a medium. And I believe that's possible interpersonally and or subjectively. Like, if I want to know what my partner is thinking, I can ask her and she can tell me. Um, <laughs> and so like off, off the page and outside of my books, I'm actually quite optimistic and, and goopy about the prospect of knowing other minds. Um, but within the narratives, within the fictions, What's interesting to me are like the blockages or obstacles that prevent characters from knowing one another, the ways in which one's attempt to project oneself into someone else's mind alienate one from one's own mind, and um, it becomes not an inner subjective connection, but a source of loneliness. So that happens in this story, where the character wants to know what other readers are thinking, or wants to know what the other mind of an author is like, but finds his own reading experience routed through 600 other minds that alienate him from himself. Um, so he becomes an other mind to himself. And in various ways, that happens to other characters in the collection. Like One is about a character trying to uh, humanely butcher a backyard chicken and keeps projecting his thoughts into the dying chicken's mind to try to understand what it's thinking, um, <laughs> and quickly becomes alienated from his own, his own mind and his own humaneness um, over the course of that story. Um, so yeah, just to kind of quickly answer your question, I think that what's interesting about that failure in the collection is that it is a source of horror, anxiety, paranoia, dread, or conflict, essentially. Um, but like outside of the book, um, yes, um, I believe you can know what other people are thinking. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Let's leave it there. <laughs> Thank you, Bennett. Our third and final finalist this evening is Paul Yoon. The stories in his collection, The Hive and the Honey, span centuries and continents, exploring both physical and spiritual dislocation. Yoon writes in a spare style that skillfully remains lyrical and evocative. Paul. Oh. Hey, everyone. Tony, what's up? Hey. How are you? Uh, grateful to be here. Bennett, Ian, um, total honor and a dream. Uh, thanks for tonight. I'm just going to read uh, the like a tweaked opening of um, a story called Komarov, which is the second story in the collection. And um, I don't think there's anything I need to explain, so I'm just going to go ahead. Um, OK, Komarov. Can everyone hear me OK? OK. It was a small hill town on the coast of Brava. She arrived in the late afternoon, stepping off the crowded train that had come in from Barcelona, and followed the signs from the taxi stand. She was wearing the shirt she wore to work because it was her nicest, and she was alone. Are you here for the fight? The driver asked when she got in. Not too violent for you. 
he winked at her through the rear view. Not knowing how to answer the first question, they hadn't talked about that, Julian hesitated. About the violence, she knew the driver meant because she was a woman and no longer young. Komarov, the driver said, and handed back a flyer. You're here for Komarov, yes? She rolled down the window, not looking at him or the flyer, and said yes, as he sped a little at a roundabout. She didn't say anything else. The sun was everywhere, the ocean smelled too. She knew the room number, so when she entered the hotel, she walked past the reception and took the elevator to the fifth floor. She found 512, paused to let a couple speaking in English continue down the sunlit hallway and then knocked. She could hear footsteps coming from inside the room. Then one of the young men she had met two days ago opened the door and let her in. The year was 1980, a Friday in the first week of June. The doors to the small balcony were open and on occasion the white curtains billowed from the wind, briefly erasing the second man who was sitting at the edge of the bed. The men had both loosened their neckties and were perspiring. Julian kept still, fixed in some space between them, which was how she had felt since she had met them in the alley behind the building where she cleaned the office floors every night. Her first thought when they had approached her was that someone had finally come to bring her back to the north or to punish her for leaving. She had spent the war and after hearing about things like this. It didn't matter if you never went in and answered any questions the South might have for you. She never had. It didn't matter because you were a traitor. You had vanished once by running away, which gave them permission to erase you a second time. So when the two men said her full name, she turned toward the dumpster, believing it was possible that this would be her last breath. Her arm in the air, holding the trash and the shredded paper of a company whose purpose she had no idea about. Her hands cracked from the bleach that seeped into her gloves, the bleach that had dimmed her sense of smell, the faint smell of the dumpster all over the unending Barcelona night. She opened her eyes, nothing happened. Now in the hotel room, one of the men said in Korean, we wouldn't have blamed you if you had changed your mind. How could she have changed her mind? They knew she would have come regardless. The one on the bed opened a bag. He explained to her that what was inside was a listening and recording device, that they were going to put a wire on her and that they would be somewhere nearby discreetly listening and recording. He asked if that would be all right. They hadn't told her that before. That was new. Juyan quickly looked around. She nodded and stepped forward, placing the flyer at the foot of the bed and unbuttoned her shirt in front of the two men who began to work in silence. She could hear and feel their breathing. They moved like a pair of enormous spiders around her, touching her as little as possible. As the mic slid up under a band and up between her breasts, she was aware that she was also sweating, that there was a smell coming from under her arms. She had spent all night smoking cigarettes and ironing her shirt, almost burning the back. Remember, one of them said, you won't have long, 10 minutes. This is only the first of what we hope are many meetings. And remember, the other said, at the end, say something like, perhaps we can keep talking and we'll wait for the response. Jiyan kept nodding. On the side table near the balcony doors next to the ashtray, she spotted a pen and a pad of paper. She asked the man behind her to light her a cigarette. Again, she heard the singing and asked if the men in the room, if they had ever been to Spain before, and they said, keep talking. They wanted to test the sound. Her mind went blank. She stepped toward the balcony doors, tapped the cigarette over the ashtray and waiting for a moment, when they weren't looking, took the pen and slipped it into her pocket. She then said something about how she had never been bare here and about the glassware on the dresser, how it was proper to set them so that they didn't touch, and whether they could all hear the singing. Then she realized she wasn't saying any of this out loud. She returned to the bed and picked up the flyer. The man closest to her looked over Juyan's shoulder and said, first in Korean and then in Russian, that the heat here was making him boil, and that no, he had never been to Spain. 
and that he was currently in the company of Lee Ju Young, 54 years old, born in North Korea, resident of Barcelona, and that the fighter on the left in the flyer was named Nikolai Komarov, a 30-year-old middleweight boxer from the Soviet Union. Tomorrow would be his first match outside the Soviet Union with an American, and Komarov had arrived last week with a trainer, a cut man, and at least two Russian bodyguards that they knew about. And that today, in an hour before his sparring session, he would take a run along the Kami de Ronda on the coast with one of the bodyguards who was their asset. And she would be there waiting for him. He stopped. The other man had put on headphones and was fiddling with the machine, gave them a thumbs up. Go out to the balcony, he said, let's test the wind. What neither of them had mentioned, but had told her two days ago in the alley, as they handed her a file, was that Nikolai Komarov was also her son. I'll stop there. Thank you. Bennett, can I take some of your water? No, it's yeah. a new one for you. Ooh. Bennett's is over Clever. here, sequestered. Okay. Uh, one thing I was thinking when I heard this, when I heard you read it just now, is why, why is the story set in 1980? Is there any particular thing about that period that was conducive to it? Is that how you conceived it to begin with? That's a with? great question. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that, Larry. I was born in 1980. <laughs> it could have been that emotional. You know, you're always looking for so those the emotional anchors when you're mm -hmm. building a story, right? So, it could have been that. It could have been, sorry, it could have been. I was thinking of sort of the math of someone who had escaped on the cusp of a war, you know, and sort of lived this sort of itinerant life. And I was kind of tracking the years mm -hmm. and settled on 1980 from there. Probably a little bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you do? I imagine you do, but you know, can you tell us what kind of you research <laughs> you do for these stories? Because they are set in Russia and Spain and Korea and upstate New York and all, all over the place. So <laughs> that one you probably didn't have to do as uh, much. That, for. Most of my research is, is about upstate New York. Yeah, um, yeah no, of course. Um, I read a lot of weird, you know, really focused textbooks. Um, mm. And I love it. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't the best student in high school and college, and I think, sort of, you know, you know, things that I probably should have been reading in in those years. I've 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 learned to really appreciate now and lately. And so, um, everything from you know, you know, weird stories about. You know, samurai having to walk across you know thousands or hundreds of miles mm -hmm. to to go, you know, live somewhere else for a season. You know, things like that. You know, it was it was fantastic. I love that stuff. I do too, actually. I like when I have yeah. to look something up or yeah, learn for sure. It. And for instance, there is like a fair amount of in a couple of stories at least interaction between people from Korea and Russians and Russia. Yeah, yeah. And you know, yeah. I. I didn't even know that Korea just came right off of Russia like that until yeah, I looked no, at it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, that was through this, um, all these books I read, but also growing up, you know, hearing about these stories, it's like, oh, where are all my relatives? You know, where do they go? And, and I re just remember my father, you know, being like, oh, I think, you know, they, they went farther north to Russia or they gone in boat and ended up in the Canary Islands, you know, and, and so, so it, I think these sort of areas were sort of always hovering in my mind. Um, and, and so to have the opportunity to engage with that creatively, like in a short form, I think is exciting. Was that, the, was that like a driving force behind this collection? Or was it more a matter of you'd written some stories, you took a look, and you, you sort of saw that it was already there? No, I think I definitely was driving sort of force, like kind of like an imagined family tree, right? Hmm. Um, and part of it was, you know, I was very far from home during lockdown, and so, you know, one way to make myself feel better was I would, I would sort of imagine like a map of where all my like people that I love are, right? And so, and then that just sort of got me thinking about, you know, just where are these family members I've never met? Like, where are they? Where were they? All that stuff, and so, and that became kind of 
like that became the canvas, right? Mm -hmm. That I was trying to sort of build within. Um, geez, I forgot what I was going to ask next. That's okay. <laughs> uh, you're, you're, as, as I said when I introduced it, your, your writing is kind of spare, um, by which I mean there's not a lot of extraneous words. It seems very, you know, word to word, very, mm -hmm. very well thought out. Do, do you arrive at that through a process of revision, or do you try to write, you know, every sentence like that? I, it's a great question. I don't know if I'm, a, you know, I'll be honest with you. I don't know if I'm aware of it. That's my honest answer. I think that's sort of how, and maybe it's like Ian was talking about this when she was up here about how she sort of um, she learned from Trevor, right? And 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 I for sure learned from Trevor too. And 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 maybe his sort of minimalistic quality kind of rubbed off on me in some way. But you know, I think I think it's. There were a lot of writers who sort of I was reading, and you know, and I think it's sort of, it's just kind of like mishmash of all of them, right? In some ways, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It actually reminded me of Hemingway a little bit, mm. because sure, it's very, yeah. yeah, you know, subject verb, yeah, object, yeah, yeah. kind yeah. of writing, yeah. not a lot of inversion and right, right, uh, extra clauses and and all of that stuff. Yeah. How long did it take you to? write these stories, were you writing them with the idea of this will be a collection, or did they just sort of come out one by one? Yeah, I definitely was aiming for a collection. Um, I think it took maybe about two years, two to three years. Um, but some, like some, stor some stories came out very quickly, um, and some stories, I think, they just they took, a, they took a really long time, you know, and I don't know. I didn't. I don't know the reason for that, right? It was sort of like I just had to meet them at the right time and the right moment, and and finding the right way in, right? Um, and sometimes it happened fast, and sometimes it didn't happen fast. So, yeah. I'm gonna ask you something that I asked you, which is: yeah. Are you always thinking in terms of stories, or do you put yeah. that aside sometimes to? No, I'm always <laughs> thinking of stories. Um, it was my first love. It was the short story writers were the first books that I was reading. Um, and falling in love with them and wanting to, like writing for me, it's like an act of love, right? You want, you're falling in love with these writers and then you want to respond to that in some way, right? And so it was always stories. Um, the two books that are longer than stories that I came out with, I just always thought they were gonna be stories. Um, it's just that the canvas was just, it was bigger, right? And so, no, I'm always thinking of stories first and I always think that it's gonna be a story. <laughs> yeah. What? What led you to become a writer? You said you were not a very good student. Was it because you were sort of thinking in terms of stories and, <laughs> and not memorizing Probably. stuff? Or? I think I was, yeah, I was in dreamland playing the guitar and, yeah, writing stories on a typewriter or something like that. Um, I think I became a writer because I fell in love with, um, uh, with contemporary fiction. And, and, and again, like love, it just, I fell in love and I just want to respond to it. And I want to be in dialogue with those, with those, you know, with those books that I love, you know, picking up you know, uh, uh, an Alice Monroe collection for the first time or picking up you know, Sabal for the first time. Or, you know, and, and, and it was, and, and that outlet, it was just like, oh my God, this is, you know, you, you've looked up and the world has sort of altered, right? And, and so you want to respond to that. And, and I think that's sort of how it started. Has, has, how has your writing developed over time? Do you feel like you're a better writer now? Or do you feel like it's no. a similar, no. similar <laughs> process? Yeah, I think it's always, I, mean, I don't know how you all feel about this, but I, I feel like it's, it's always you start over again and you don't know anything. And, it's, and I think that sort of fear and that doubt and that kind of like blankness, I don't know. I think that's also like what drives it too, to sort of you know, stare at that blank canvas and be like, oh, I don't know how to do this, but I'm going to try, right? And so, and then that leap, right? That's exciting too. How do you decide on the title of a collection? I mean, you, you chose from one of your stories. Uh, you just try them on for size and see what works, or did, did that feel like a good thematic fit? You mean for each story in the collection? No, I mean for the collection. Oh, the, the hive collection. And, the hive and the honey. 
I felt that that was the one that fit the most. Yeah, yeah. I was waffling over that one and um, Person of Korea, which is the second to last story in the collection. And, and I think, you know, I was sort of like thinking about them, but I thought maybe Person of Korea was, Korea was just a little too like sort of on the nose. And so um, I thought maybe going with the more, say, evocative uh, title might be more interesting for the reader, too. Right, and to have that sort of engagement with the reader. And how do you how do you put them in order? Does, does that happen uh, fairly naturally, or do you are you always moving things around trying to find the right? Place? I think I'm thinking about it both in kind of a macro level where I it starts with a story set in upstate New York because that's sort of it's like home base. You know what I mean? Like I, I need the sort of like the the, the anchor of that. Mm -hmm. Right, like safe zone, you know, um, and then from there, sort of leaping. Um, and I knew I want to end with um, um, a story called the Valley of the Moon um, because I thought it was the most sort of like vast story. Um, mm -hmm. And and so I wanted that, like I want to start with that focus and then kind of like flower out, right, blossom out. Um, I knew that, and so I was thinking about that, but I was also thinking about how stories move from one to the next, and so. Boss on the obscene New York story, if it ends with um, like a scene of two people um, fake sparring, mm -hmm. like in the field at night, um, I thought it'd be really interesting to move from that image to a uh, story literally about boxing, which is sort of which is the one I read from, right? Yeah. And so, um, so to think about those like micro movements was really important to me too, like how one story ends. And how the next one begins. Right. Well, you go yeah. from sparring to boxing yeah, to summarize. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> it escalates pretty quickly. <laughs> right. are, are any of these stories contemporary, as in, you know, happening now? They all seem to be said at different times. Are any of these stories happening now? Uh, well, or. I don't think so. Wait, I guess the, um, the 90s are about. You know, hmm. as contemporary as I got for this collection. Yeah. Why do you uh, Why do you think that is? I don't know. I don't know. That's a really good question. Yeah. I mean, I've talked in the past to writers who have, <laughs> it, 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 who have said that, you know, they don't want the solution to the story problem to be someone looks something up on their phone. Oh, right, right, right. Right. Or <laughs> goes to a computer or makes. Yeah. Phone. I don't know if it's that. I think it's again. I'm just sort of. I like reading about history. Mm -hmm. Right, and so part of it is just being inspired by like weird details when I'm reading these books, and so my engagement with narrative and and sort of storytelling is like from the start historical because I'm reading right. these books, right? And so I think part of it is that, yeah. Do you are you looking up certain details? As you write, or do you just write the story and then check to see if that works in terms of the period? Yeah, I'm reading these amazingly weird books, and 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 I'm I'm you know writing down all these things that catch my eye, and and then from there, sort of trying to build a story um, from those details, and not the book. So the the the, the things I write down, and those objects, and those bits of architecture, and all that stuff. That's that's sort of those are sort of my pull stars, right? Those are mm -hmm. the things that I'm I'm using to guide me. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Larry. Thank you, Paul. Uh, before we announce the winner of the story prize, let's hear it for the all three accomplished writers. <laughs> Good crowd tonight. <laughs> um, yeah, any, I mean, any one of them would make a great winner, and, and that's what we try to do is really make it hard on, on the judges. Um, don't forget that there are signed copies of the books for sale in the lobby afterwards. There's a reception after this on this floor. Um, and if you're watching remotely, 
Um, we have a list up on bookshop.org of all the short story collections we read in 2023 with these three at the top of the list. And now, Jay Lindsay, president of the Chisholm Foundation, will announce the 20th winner of the Story Prize. Thank you, Larry. You know, Larry does so much to make this evening happen and to elicit such great thoughts from the authors. I just want to give you a little shout out as well. The Chisholm Foundation is really proud to have supported this award for the last two decades, and we are very grateful for all of the wonderful authors that have appeared over those years. A lot has changed in our world since we gave the very first story prize to Edwidge Datikat. But one thing that has not changed is the vitality and energy and creativity of the stories and the collections that are submitted. It is really uh, always an eye-opening experience to read these books. So. Without further ado, let me just say that the 113 applicants for the Story Prize have been winnowed down to three finalists, and our judges did the heavy lifting of deciding on the winner. And the winner this year is Paul Yoon. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, okay, hold on. I wrote something. Um, okay, so I, I know how much our days have been shaky, uncertain, and completely devastatingly heartbreaking. Um, and so I feel really privileged to have been gifted this uh, sudden joy. And I just wanted to begin by saying that that I'm very grateful to be feeling joyful um, right now. And I hope I can keep it shining for a little bit and share with it with you all tonight. Um, Larry Dark, uh, thank you for being a champion and number one boss of the short story for decades. Uh, we're so grateful. Can everyone hear me? OK. We're so grateful for all that you've done, um, not only with this award, uh, but all the years before the Story Prize, too. Uh, thank you to the Lotus Club, Asher and the Dark family, um, Julie and Jay Lindsay and the Chisholm Foundation, uh, to the judges, Tanya, Allison, and Murphy. Thank you as well for your time, your dedication and support um, to Yi Yun and Bennett. Uh, to be here with you both is such a gift. Uh, Yi Yun, it's impossible to truly express how much we look up to you. Um, and love you so much. Um, thank you for your genius and kindness. Um, uh, Bennett, brilliant Bennett, master architect. Uh, what an honor to meet you for the first time to many more gatherings and to the hope that this is the start of a friendship. Um, Okay, so if you notice, I'm wearing, you might have noticed I'm wearing an Oxford shirt. I don't know if it fits with my outfit. Um, but it, there's a reason for it, and I want to share it with you all tonight. Um, it's because right after college, I got a job at Vintage Books, uh, 299 Park, before they moved to Broadway. Um, and my first boss was named Russell Perot. And he often wore Oxfords to work. And Russell, or Rusty as I called him, is no longer with us. Um, but I wanted to share with you how we opened up the Vintage Books Backlist Library to me, uh, which was where I discovered the short stories of Alice Monroe, 
um, Ann Beatty, Richard Yates, et cetera. Um, and then he'd take me to, uh, he'd take me, uh, he, or he'd, and he'd let me take whatever stories I wanted. It was always short stories for me, as I was telling Larry. And then he'd sneak me up the back stairs, uh, where we'd enter the, the contrails of Sunny Meadows, you know, beautiful cigarette smoke. Um, it was like we'd enter some upper level of heaven. And this is where I was covertly introduced to the old uh, Pantheon paperbacks, um, like Cortazar, um, I think Bernard, actually. Um, and John Berger's Life Changing for Me um, into their Labors trilogy. Um, the first two are short story collections. Um, all these writers from around the world. And I mention this because I really believe I am where I am today as an artist in whatever style or creative vision I've devoted myself to, in part because Russell opened the doors wide open to these incredible libraries um, and gave me access to both the North American writers and the writers from all over the world. Um, these two sort of spheres I'm always trying to engage with and are inspired by. Um, so Rusty, I hope you are looking down tonight I miss you, and I think of you every day. And I know that if you were here, you'd um, roll your eyes and tell me I didn't tie this correctly, and <laughs> redo it perfectly. Um, I'm almost done, I promise. I just want to say thank you to a few people, many of who are here tonight. First, my beloved, brilliant, and beautiful wife, Laura Vandenberg. <laughs> uh, whom I've been traveling on this writing road with since day one, uh, 20 years now. To my brothers, Ralph Sneedon, Don Lee, and Ethan Rutherford. Uh, to my sisters, Elliot Holt, and Lauren Groff, wherever she is. The Atlantic, Oliver Monday, Libby Flores, and Baum. Cressida Leishon and the exquisiteness that is the New Yorker. Katie Freeman, Nan Rittenhouse, and Mary Sue Rucci Books. Simon Toop, Marion Duver, and the Clegg Agency to Hannah Tinty, who might be here, I think, or not. <laughs> Hannah, hi, hi. Um, who published my very first story a million decades ago. Um, and finally, to the two people I would like to dedicate this award to, Bill Clegg and Mary C. Rucci. In your friendship, you have given me a home. I love feeling the years we've shared. And I love, too, feeling like we're only just getting started. Here's to you. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. <laughs>